God, we gather as your people this morning to praise your name and to remember your goodness towards us. We look to Jesus as the source and inspiration of our faith and seek to hear and understand his sometimes challenging words. God of mercy and justice, when we fail to see what you are up to in our world, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. When we jump to conclusions and suggest quick fixes to complex issues, forgive our short-sightedness about life. When we're more in tune with the values of the world than your ways of peace, forgive our inattention to you. Tune us in to your words and your ways. Amen. God's ways are not always our ways, yet God is eager to show us grace and mercy. So hear the good news when we turn to God with forgiven and given new life. Thanks be to God. One of our Bible readings that we're going to hear shortly uses the imagery of running a race, which seems quite relevant having just finished the Commonwealth Games where there were lots of races that we could watch on TV. And if you'll indulge me just for a moment, I'm a person who likes running, so this is a topic that interests me. When I was younger, much younger, my running was all around sprinting, which is running as fast as you can over a very short distance. Um, and every race was like over in less than 30 seconds. And just very occasionally I would run the really difficult long distance race of 400 metres, which was once all around the oval and back to the start. That was such a long way. Which is kind of ironic in a way because these days my running uh, involves the sport of orienteering, which typically is 8 to 10 kilometres of running that takes, well, a little longer than 30 seconds. But in thinking about this this week, I was thinking about what's important when you run. And there's another great runner in our midst here. Philip, I know, is a great runner as well. Um, so I'm wondering, what's important when you're running a race, do you think? And if you've watched any of the Olympics or Commonwealth Games, what's important when you run? Sorry? Remember to breathe. Remember to breathe, yep, that's really important. Though in sprint races they hardly breathe at all. They don't need to. But Satisfaction, yeah. Perseverance, yeah. How about speed? Does speed matter? It helps. Yeah, I reckon speed can be important. Pacing yourself, if it's a longer race, you don't want to kind of start off really fast and then kind of run out of oomph. Anything else? Don't break because you won't even get to start. Right. How about paying attention to your body during the race? what signals your body might be giving you. Or if you're in a race with other competitors, do you have to think about what the other competitors are doing? Probably can be helpful. And in the Bible reading this morning, there are some other factors again, over and above some of those that we've mentioned, that can be even more important when we run in the race of faith. And we'll explore those shortly. But first of all, we're going to sing another song. And it picks up this idea of perseverance, which is part of running as well. And it comes, it's an Indian song. It comes from the Assam region in northeast India. And in that part of the world, in India, there's a definite cost to following Jesus. And 
This song has quite an interesting history. If you want to go home and Google, uh, it, it, there's quite a story behind this song. I'm sure many of us will know it. It's, I've decided to follow Jesus. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. From Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth, whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. And from Hebrews 11. By faith the people of Israel passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell 
after the army had marched round them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that is so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God may your may Lord, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory. Watching all of the athletics races at the Commonwealth Games brought back both good memories for me and not so pleasant memories from my childhood. There were a few standout races. First, there was the heats of the men's 4 by 100 metres relay. I don't know if any of you saw that. The Australian team was doing really, really well. They were running really well. Coming up to the final baton change, and this happened. Our last runner, our brilliant sprinter who'd done really well in the 100 metres, Brian Browning was his name, tried to take off, but he slipped and tripped and fell flat on his face. That was the end of the race for our relay team, which unfortunately brought back some vivid memories of my last ever competitive athletics race, which happened in year 12. It was also a four by 100 meters relay. I was the third runner. We were doing really well. Got to the final baton change and the last runner didn't fall over like that, but he took off like way too fast and there was no way I was going to catch him. And we got way beyond the permitted zone. You're allowed to change the baton. And we were disqualified. Uh, so even though we'd practiced for hours and he was one of my best mates, it just shows that in athletics and in relays, things can still go horribly wrong. But soon after watching that one, uh, there was another race that came on the TV, which was the men's final of the 1500 metres. 
and unlike some of the races at the Commonwealth Games, this one was stacked with champions. There were world champions, there were people who'd almost won the Olympics last year, and there was one Australian, Ollie Hoare, who wasn't really given much chance in the race. And that's a four lap race, and for three and a half laps, the Australian, Ollie Hoare, kind of just hung in there, and he hung in there, and he was in about fourth or fifth place. And it got to the last 100 metres of the race, so they've just got a little way to go, and I guess my expectation was, well, he's going to kind of fade out now and he'll come eighth or tenth or something, which is what often happens to Australian runners. But no, going down the straight, he seemed to be getting faster and faster while everyone else was slowing and slowing, and he actually overtook them right at the finish line and won the gold medal. And it was a race that showed for me that if you have belief and if you have perseverance, then sometimes amazing things can happen, even if they're very unexpected. And just one more race that was a highlight for me, okay, the next slide, was the women's marathon. And there were three Australians in that, and they each did really well. They were all mums, so they're into their 30s, they've all had children. The race was won by this lady, Jessica Stanson, and just the beaming smile as she came down towards the finish. She knew she was going to win. She stopped and thanked the crowd for being there and for coming out and cheering, uh, and you couldn't wipe the smile off her face for a long, long time. And it was just lovely to see that joy in her. Even though a marathon is the most taxing of races and it's very hard on athletes and you have to run through a lot of pain to get to the finish, um, she was full of joy. And so to our readings, starting with that reading from Hebrews. And this chapter in Hebrews, as we mentioned last week, is often called the Hall of Faith. And it focuses on some well-known heroes of the faith like Abraham and Sarah and Moses. But this week we get down to a wider cast of characters. So we hear about the faithful people of God crossing the Red Sea on dry land and seeing the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. We hear about faithful leaders from the time of the judges and then on to Samuel and David, people who won great victories for Israel on the battlefield, who administered justice, who were delivered from their enemies. And then... In just another breath, as it were, the writer goes on and says, well, guess what? There were equally faithful people who didn't get on so well, who were mocked, who were persecuted, who were put in prison, who were stoned to death like the prophet Jeremiah was, people sawn in two like the prophet Isaiah was, people who went around destitute, persecuted, wandering in deserts just to survive. And then there's a very important line. It says, all of these people, whether their faith led to great victories or whether their faith led to great suffering, they were all commended for their faith. So one important lesson that comes from this chapter, this hall of faith, chapter is that faith in God is no guarantee that our life is going to be easy or straightforward. But the converse of that is also true, which is that 
if we do suffer, that's not a sign that we're being unfaithful because lots of faithful people have a very hard time in life. But what this long list of faithful people does show us, I think, is how we might approach our own walk of faith, which this author calls a race. But given the broad range of characters that he's referred to, it shows that there's no one way to run this race. But we have the witness or the example of the many people of faith who've gone before us. Those listed in this chapter, but those right through church history. Those people who've been uh, important parts of our lives. But we are told that if we're to run this race, we need to throw off everything that hinders or entangles us. One of the Greek words there is actually weight. It's like there are weights that some of us carry, burdens. And you can imagine running a race like a marathon. Imagine trying to carry you know, an extra 10 kilos on your back or something. You just wouldn't. You try and be as light as possible. So we have to throw off everything that burdens us, that will make the race more difficult, that might tempt us to give up. But we have to also run the race that's set before us. I can't run someone else's race. You can't run my race. We each have to run our own race. And so what might be a burden to one person, maybe excessive expectations of other people might be a spur to another person. Or it might be that for one person taking on several roles and several duties and approaching several things would be completely overwhelming for one person, but energizing for another person. So we all have to run our own race. But the one thing we're told is we have to run with perseverance. It's not a sprint, this race of faith. It's not even a marathon. It's, in fact, a lifelong race. So we want to start strong, but we want to be strong all the way through the race, right to the very end if we possibly can. And beyond those tips, the author says there's one more really vital factor, which is where we need to put our focus, where we need to be looking at in order to stay on the track, as it were. And we're called to look to Jesus who's described as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And those words, pioneer and perfecter, could be translated in various ways. So they could be translated as the source of our faith and the goal of our faith, or as the beginning and the end of our faith. Jesus shows us everything that we need. He's shown us the path and he's run this race before us. So Jesus knows the typical temptations that we face, the typical distractions that we face. He knows what makes us weary. He knows what might make us give up. And in his own race, for Jesus, the biggest barrier was obviously the cross. It's agony and it's shame. And the author of this book of Hebrews suggests that Jesus endured the cross by keeping his focus on what lay beyond the cross. The joy of knowing that 
by walking this particular path, he would open the way for others to enjoy a similar relationship with God that he enjoyed. And also we're told for the joy of sitting in God's presence. So sometimes this race of faith will be quite painful and challenging and costly as it was for Jesus. Sometimes it will be filled with joy as it was for Jesus. But the, the lesson I think Hebrews wants to teach us is that we need to persevere through the good and the bad and never to give up. So, just summarising three things then that will help us in our own race of faith are these. First is the support of the crowd, that cloud of witnesses that's talked about. In races that I do in orienteering, it's usually just me out running by myself. There's no one around. But I have done a couple of runs where there are crowds and people around supporting the runners. And it's amazing how you get encouraged by the people yelling things out, you know, go on, you're doing well, you know, keep going and things like that. Just simple things being sort of yelled out from around you spur you on to keep going. So one of the really important jobs for all of us is to speak those words of encouragement to one another, to encourage each of us to keep going in our walk of faith, to pray for one another. Those things are really vital. Another factor is how we run. Hebrew suggests that actually it's endurance and perseverance that matter more than other aspects of running which suggests to me that we need to find habits or practices or a routine that will feed our spiritual lives and that will feed our lives over the long haul. So it's something to reflect on. What habits do we have? What spiritual practices have we built into our lives to give us that perseverance and endurance? And then the third factor, of course, is our focus. Where is our focus? What are we mostly looking at? And in this race, it's not a race to the finish line. It's not who's going to get there first. It's actually we're all in this race together. We have to run our own individual race, but we're all in it together. And the focus is on Jesus. He's the one where to focus on. I then want to look very briefly at our second reading this morning from Isaiah and his calling to be a prophet. And various artwork that I came across, this was about the best what I came across. And these, that's an artist's impression of what these seraphim, these angels, these burning ones, were like two wings covering their eyes, two covering their feet, and two used for flying. Isaiah is in the temple in Jerusalem when he has this vision of God. God sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the angels call out to each other, holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. And if those words seem slightly familiar to you, it's because it's part of our communion liturgy. Every time we celebrate communion, we either say or sing those particular words. But in response to this vision of God and God's greatness, all that Isaiah can think of is, woe is me, because I am a sinful person and I live among sinful persons, people, 
and my eyes have seen the glory and the holiness of God. Yet the response of God to Isaiah is grace. His lips and his heart are cleansed. And then God calls for a messenger to go to the people, to speak to the people. And Isaiah responds, well, here am I. You might as well send me, God. And the message, the message that he's going to take, if you want to, I guess, recruit someone to a ministry, this isn't the message that I would give them. The message is, go and speak to these people and make their minds dull. Close their ears, shut their eyes, lest they should listen and turn to God and be healed. In other words, go and speak to the people about me and my ways, but don't expect them to listen. Don't expect them to take the message to heart. So this is Isaiah, who's considered probably the greatest of all the prophets who wrote down their uh, messages in our scriptures. So he's the greatest of the prophets. And he's given this awful, awful ministry and the seemingly fruitless task of bringing God's message to a people who do not want to listen and who will not listen. And it's interesting when Jesus was struggling in his ministry, he quotes these words from Isaiah 6 about the people not listening and not hearing and not understanding as a way of trying to explain why people were rejecting his message. And in lots of ways, we face a similar dilemma today. I mean, there's just some numbers from the last two census dates, 2016-2021. And yes, the numbers in Australia who say um, they adhere to Christianity is going down, but the fastest growing group is those of no religion. So people who have no faith, no religious faith, and not interested at all in the institutional church. So it's tempting to think that we face a similar situation and a similar task to Isaiah and indeed to Jesus about sharing God's message in a world where not many people seem to want to listen or respond positively. But then perhaps it's always been like that. We're not actually looking for worldly success. And the founding document of the Uniting Church is this great little document called The Basis of Union. And I pulled out just a couple of sentences out of it. It says, the church is a pilgrim people, always on the way to a promised land, to a promised goal, here on earth. She does not have a continuing city, but seeks one to come. The Uniting Church affirms that it belongs to the people of God on the way to the promised land. So we're on the way, we're in this race, but we don't ever quite get there. And the church prays that God will use its worship witness and service, so our lives, our ministry, how we live in the world, to God's eternal glory. So, yes, we're never going to quite arrive at the destination, but how we live, how we worship, is hopefully going to bring glory to God and be a signpost to those around us. So we don't know who may respond to our message. We don't know how they'll respond to our witness of love and hope. But rather than fret about that, what the readings this morning 
would say to us is that we're called to remain faithful and to persevere and to run the race that's been set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus and following in his footsteps and the path that he has shown us. Amen. So we're going to sing a song now, a song that is often sung um, on All Saints Day. This song remembers and reflects and gives thanks for the many people of faith who've walked before us and how their example and their lives have inspired us. So let us stand as we sing, Lord, for the years.
Sue's so bringing the offering forward and you might like to do the same at Croydon. So let us pray. Faithful God, we offer our gifts today and the service of our lives in thankful response for your love and care towards us. Help us to continue to walk and indeed run our journey of faith with Jesus. And as we journey, give us perseverance and courage and joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for notices, and I know Sue's got a couple and Catherine's got one. I've got just one very quick one. Um, I received during the week uh, this little magazine from Act for Peace, which are the, is the organisation that uh, runs the Christmas Bowl each year and does a whole lot of other things. And I thought it was interesting just in a, a world that seems so fractured at the moment and there's so much suffering everywhere it's good to read some good news stories some happier things more joyful things uh, and i'll leave a copy of this here and one down at croydon but just some of the headings uh, coming together to show the people of ukraine they're not alone uh, supporting Afghan people uprooted from their homes. One stone can move a mountain. Lots of young people uh, taking the ration challenge, which is living basically on the poverty line uh, to raise funds. Uh, finding hope for the future. Uh, backing communities on the front line of the climate crisis. So there's lots of good news stories there that we need to balance out all of the not so good stuff that tends to fill our news bulletins. So Catherine's got a notice. This Thursday evening, the Living Faith Group is going to start meeting. Um, I think there's about half a dozen of us at the moment. Um, we're going to meet at Peter's house um, 7.30, so if you um, if you're still interested in, in coming, um, contact me or Peter um, to find the address. And yes, so we'll be uh, discussing justice matters and hopefully living our faith. Yep. A couple of notices from me. Um, the first one, I think, is um, fuel for Father's Day, with Father's Day coming up quickly. Um, this is ways that you can um, think of your father or any um, important male in your life, uh, whether still living or not, um, by also supporting Mission Aviation Fellowship. Um, and you can either buy uh, a jerry can of fuel or um, there are... Uh, ways the children can uh, do a colouring for their, their dad or granddad, um, or just an in-memory card. So if you want to know more about that, see me. Um, and also, this week, I was um, got a phone call from a lady from um, Samaritan's Purse about Operation Christmas Child, which has been a... Um, a mission of this church for quite some years now. So there are a few ways that you can um, do um, Operation Christmas Child. You can either get a, a, a shoebox. Um, I've got some shoeboxes there if anybody wants one. Fill it with uh, six special things and um, and then a little bit money of money to cover the cost of uh, shipping the shoebox. Or you can bring along fillers, which is a way that we've done it um, for a number of years now in the past, um, where you just bring along some of those special items um, and we take them along to the um, distribution centre and it helps to fill boxes that haven't got sufficient things in them. 
or you can purchase a box online, which uh, started, of course, during COVID, where you pay $30 and um, then the, uh, the organisation fills the box for you. And the lady told me a little bit more about this way of doing it, which was interesting. Um, it, it, it is assisting um, opera uh, sorry, Samaritan's Purse to get into countries where they're normally not allowed to get into. Um, because instead of filling the boxes here in Australia or in New Zealand or England, wherever else, and then having to take a team over to that country, and, that, and that's where the difficult part comes in, um, they're actually filling them locally. So they're getting into countries that are restricted um, by just saying, here's the money, fill the boxes with local produce, um, and they can get this Christian message out to the children in those countries. So it's a good way of doing it. And the six important items that go in these boxes are something to love, something to play with, something to wear, something for school, personal hygiene, and also something special. Um, and that can be a letter from you, or a photograph, or it can be <clears throat> a bit of jewellery, something like that. Something that you would feel special or, or feel that the child would find it special. And again, if you want to know anything more about these two missions, um, you can see me or give me a call or send me an email. Okay, any other notices I've forgotten there? Right, I'll lead us into our prayers. Um, I've got a few here that I've written down. Um, for a number of years now, Alan and I have kept in contact with a, a lady called Elizabeth in Ireland. She's a very distant relative of Alan's mum's. Um, and her and her sister this week lost their brother, George. George was an, a very special person. <clears throat> At 78, he was the oldest Down's syndrome person still alive in the UK and Ireland. And I think that's a credit to his family and to the, um, the care centre that he was living in for, for the last many number of years. <clears throat> and they just adored him. So we think of Elizabeth and Eileen, <clears throat> pardon me, at the loss of George. Um, we think of Kathy, who is here today and from a, um, a successful surgery, we believe. Um, we think of Alan, um, again, recovering from hopefully a successful surgery. Um, and Janet, Jean's daughter, who is, has come back from Fiji uh, not well, and she's got shingles on top of all her other health issues. So we think of Janet. Any other prayers that you'd like to share with us today? And we pray for the skill of the surgeons and doctors and nurses who make you well. We can, we can pray for the skill of the, uh, the, all the medical team, the doctors, the nurses, and anybody else who's got That's anything. The robot. The robot. <laughs> yes. Um, the skill that... that um, we have access to today is amazing. Yes. Oh, well, my brother in law, uh, John, is in care. We'll have to stay there and uh, have a bit of trouble adjusting. So we pray for Philip's brother in law, John, who has had to go into care and, and he's having trouble adjusting to that new way of life. And we pray for his family. Pray, pray for Barbara. How is Barbara? Okay, so we pray for Barbara, who's um, struggling a little bit with her health. She had a bad night and is not able to be with us this morning. So, prayers for her. Okay, let us pray together. God be with all these people we have named today. Help them to know they are loved by you. Gracious God, please hear our prayers for the wider human family in its joy and in its distress. Gather us up into the reconciling embrace of your love that we may lead others into everything that creates love, joy and peace. We pray for those who feel ground down or <clears throat> broken, isolated or alienated. We pray for the hungry, 
homeless and anxious in our midst. We pray for those living through war and despair. We pray for the frightened, the confused, the dying and the grieving. We pray for those tempted by alcohol and drugs. We pray for the church with its truth and error, its faith and its fear. We pray for all who work for Christ's way of reconciliation, justice, compassion and peace. Loving God, you tend to us with such care. Listen now as we unburden ourselves of the joys and the concerns we carry. Listen to the names of those who need healing. Listen to the challenges we face in unemployment, in finances, in habits, in fears. Listen to the things we do not understand. Listen to the places where we hurt in heart, spirit, mind or body. Listen to how happiness rises in us as we think of birthdays, reunions, vacations and celebrations. God of Jesus Christ, we offer our prayers this morning in the service of your kingdom of grace, where no good thing is discarded and no loving deed is wasted. Amen. And we now pray together in the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let me see, see more and more, see the beauty of a person, not the color of the skin, see the faces of the homeless with no one to take them in, see discouragement because she'll never win, see the face of a
a benediction today. Friends, go into the world this week held in the loving embrace of God, inspired by the courage of Jesus Christ and led by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And our song of blessing will sing, May the feet of God walk with you.